So I'd like to welcome everyone today to uh, our public meeting uh, entitled Australia's Crisis Election, uh, the Way Forward for the Working Class. Uh, my name is Max Boddy. I'm the Assistant National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party and was a candidate for the SEP running in the New South Wales Senate. And I'll be chairing today's meeting. The 2022 Australian federal election was a crisis election like no other. The combined primary vote for the Labor Party and the Liberal National Coalition dropped to around 68.3%. This is the lowest total vote for the ruling parties upon which Australian capitalism has relied since World War II. Never before has this taken place. The Albanese Labor government has now been installed in office despite the primary vote for Labor dropping to just 32.6%. Less than a third of the country voted for the government. Registering their hostility to the two major parties, millions of workers and young people voted for the so-called minor parties or independents. This result is an historic collapse of the support for the two major parties. This is not only a crisis for, the part, for these parties, but for the rule of the capitalist class in this country who have relied on the two-party system since Federation. The election outcome has both domestic and international significance. Like no other election in recent history, it shattered the idea of Australian exceptionalism. Australian exceptionalism. That is the conception that this country is an island oasis, free of the class struggles and political turmoil of elsewhere. In reality, the working class of Australia is passing through immense political and social experiences directly paralleled with workers across the globe. Only our party warned in this election that whichever party came to power, Labor or the coalition, nothing would be resolved for ordinary people. It would continue and deepen the war agenda and the related class war at home. This would mean increasing the bellicose confrontations with Russia and China abroad and the austerity program against the working class domestically. Overshadowing the entire election was the rising cost of living, the result of both the US NATO proxy war in the Ukraine, the impact on the global supply chain due to the unchecked spread of COVID-19, and the massive budget deficits created by the funneling of trillions of dollars to big business throughout the pandemic. Despite the official election campaign claiming the pandemic is over, workers confront mass death and illness as COVID is allowed to spread virtually unrestrained. Since the beginning of this year, there have been 7.2 million cases in Australia and more than 6,700 people have died. The most significant outcome of the election was the continued decline in support for the Labor Party. In the last federal election in 2019, Labor lost the unlosable election as its primary vote fell to just 33%, the lowest level since 1934. This trend deepened this year. Labor's primary vote dropped again by 0.8%. The sharper swings were in working class electorates. Now to demonstrate this development, I wanna put a graph on screen. This is the first preference swing to Labor across all the electorates in the country, ordered by socioeconomic disadvantage with the most socioeconomically disadvantaged on the left and the most advantaged on the right. As you can see, Labor's vote declined in 85 of the 151 electorates. Uh, the predominant electorates in which the vote declined were areas of high social disadvantage on the left. But this is only half the picture. In the next graph, you can see the decline in Labor's vote from the, two, from the 2016 election. Labor has lost votes in 92 of the 151 electorates, with dramatic swings against it in low socioeconomic areas and electorates, and electorates that cover working class suburbs. In contrast, as you can see on the other end of the scale, the affluent elections, uh, electorates have seen the highest swing to Labor. Let's have a closer look at some of these electorates. First, if we look at Fowler, this covers the working class suburbs of southwestern Sydney. It is an uh, ethnically diverse population and includes the suburbs of Liverpool, uh, Cabramatta and Fairfield. The electorate has one of the highest levels of social, dis social disadvantage in the country at 72%.
Uh, it is being disproportionately impacted by COVID, both in terms of deaths and infections. Now, Fowler has been a safe Labor electorate since its creation, but factional disputes in the Labor Party led to the installing of the deeply unpopular Senator Christina Keneally. Having already suffered a 6.8% swing against Labor in the 2019 elections, uh, in 2022, it lost a massive 18.49% of the vote, losing the seat uh, and over 25% of the Labor vote in just two elections. Now, this was not just because of Keneally. Similar numbers are seen in other working class electorates. In the Victorian seat of Caldwell, which includes the former car manufacturing hub of Broadmeadows, whose car plants were shut down with the help of the unions, the swing against Labor in the last two elections exceeds 14%. On the other end of the scale, in the Victorian seat of Menzies, which is one of the most richest electorates in the country, you'll see that while the Liberals retained the seat, it was with a slim margin of just 1%, as Labor gained 5.88% more of the votes since 2009, uh, 2016. The Labor Party is rightly seen by whole layers of workers as the party of big business. While Labor has picked up support in the affluent Blue Ribbon suburbs previously held by the Liberal Party, many of the votes there went to the so-called Teal Independents. The Teals are neither independent nor offer any progressive solution for workers. Bankrolled by billionaires, they stood in affluent seats under the fraudulent banner that the climate crisis can be solved by the same capitalist profit system that produced it. These numbers are a limited electoral measure uh, of the imploding base of the two ruling political parties. Last year, the Coalition and Labor tried to stifle this shift against them by passing anti-democratic electoral laws designed to remove other parties. Working in partnership, they trebled the number of members required to remain a registered political party, allowing just three months to get the required number amid the delta wave of COVID and lockdowns across the country. The SEP alone fought a campaign against these laws and we won considerable support. Nevertheless, we could not meet the deadline and these laws were used to deregister us. This meant our candidates could not run under our party name on the ballot papers, effectively rendering us anonymous. Voters had to wade through the names of all the other parties, including ones misleadingly claiming the name socialist to find us. Now we've always said a vote for our party is a conscious one. Never has this been as true as in this election. Despite not having our party name on ballot papers, we received 11,359 votes across the three states with votes still being counted. This result highlights the significance of our intervention into the election. Due to our deregistration, we had to spend the first two weeks gathering 100 signatures for our six candidates in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. In just 10 days, we secured more than 750 signatures from contacts, supporters and electoral members who supported not just our democratic right to stand, but wanted socialist candidates to be on the ballot papers. During the four week campaign, we produced and distributed more than 90,000 election statements across the three states. This was possible thanks to the critical support of our electoral members who did much of the letterboxing. We published 62 articles on the World Socialist website, including 21 statements from the candidates. In addition, we interviewed more than 70 people, including striking nurses, bus drivers and teachers. We spoke to students on the campuses, workers on the job and residents of the flood impacted region of Lismore. We were featured in six radio interviews and one newspaper article. In the three weeks now since polling day, our warnings have been vindicated. The Labor government has deepened the agenda of war abroad and war at home. However, workers are not remaining silent. The trade unions, who are unable to keep a lid on the strikes throughout the election, are facing workers who want to fight against the destruction of their living conditions. For this growing movement to find a way forward, it must break out of the shackles of the trade unions and the Labor Party and forge an independent political path with a socialist and anti-capitalist perspective. To discuss this and more, we have three speakers today. The first will be 
Cheryl Crisp, the National Secretary of the, uh, of the SEP. We'll then take a report from Deepal Jaya Sepera from our Sri Lankan section and finish with a report from Oscar Grenfell. After the speakers, we'll open up for questions and discussion and then call for a collection to our $50,000 election fund before concluding uh, by pointing to our important Marxist literature and ending with some announcements. So firstly, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Comrade Cheryl Crisp. Cheryl is a National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in Australia and a writer for the World Socialist website. She was a founding member of the Socialist Labor League, which was a forerunner of the SEP. So I'd like to give her a warm welcome today. Welcome, Comrade Cheryl. Thanks, Max. In opening my remarks, I wanted to quote uh, some, uh, some passages from Trotsky, Leon Trotsky. The world political situation as a whole is chiefly characterised by a historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat. The economic prerequisite for the proletarian revolution has already in general achieved the highest point of fruition that can be reached under capitalism. Mankind's productive forces stagnate. Already new inventions and improvements fail to raise the level of material wealth. Conjunctural crises under the conditions of the social crisis of the whole capitalist system inflict ever heavier deprivations and suffering upon the masses. Growing unemployment in its turn deepens the financial crisis of the state and undermines the unstable monetary systems. Democratic regimes, as well as fascists, stagger on from one bankruptcy to another. International relations present no better picture. Under the increasing tension of capitalist disintegration, imperialist antagonisms reach an impasse at the height of which separate clashes and bloody local disturbances must inevitably coalesce into a conflagration of world dimensions. The bourgeoisie, of course, is aware of the mortal danger to its domination represented by a new war. But that class is now immeasurably less capable of averting war than on the eve of 1914. If one were to assume that these lines were written today, it would be entirely understandable. In fact, as I said, they were written by Leon Trotsky in the Transitional Program for Socialist Revolution, the founding document of the Fourth International in 1938. Notwithstanding the very real differences which have taken place in the intervening 84 years, the situation internationally now not just resembles that of 1938, but in many respects mirrors and exceeds it. As Max said, our meeting has been called to discuss the Australian election, but it is not possible to understand it outside of a discussion on the international situation in which it was held. The world's population face a threat on multiple fronts. The ongoing COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, which threatens to escalate to a broader and even global nuclear conflagration, and the consequences of the first two, surging inflation, food shortages, poverty, hunger, and possible starvation. World capitalism faces a crisis of unprecedented dimensions. Trotsky's prediction that mankind faces socialism or barbarism is a very stark and real one today. In 2022, the third year of the pandemic, there are now 20 million dead from a virus. This figure is comparable to the entire death toll of World War I. Declarations that the pandemic is behind us is a foul lie. That the toll is rising and accelerating is not because of the characteristics of this virus, but because governments in every country, with the exception of China, have decided that life is expendable. The recent suppression of infections in Shanghai proves that COVID can both be suppressed and eliminated. And contrary to the media declarations that the Chinese population have lived under police-imposed lockdowns for two and a half years, in fact, 
they have actually functioned with with predominantly pre-pandemic lives. When infections arise, as they inevitably do, they are dealt with swiftly and effectively. But effective as the Chinese measures are, COVID, just as war and climate change, cannot be fought on a national basis, but only internationally. Viruses, missiles, and rising global temperatures know no borders. The 20 million dead were unnecessary deaths. Of the 540 million infected worldwide, anything from 10 to 30% will suffer with long COVID and possibly lifelong health implications. The dispensing of the lives of the elderly has given way to the same policy toward, toward all ages, including children. The compulsion that schools reopen to face-to-face learning had nothing to do with the mental health concerns for young people and everything to do with getting their parents back to work. In the 20 months to October 2021, 5.2 million children lost at least one parent or caregiver. The figures for the intervening eight months are not yet available. The impact physically and psychologically of that devastating experience on a young person is incalculable. Calculable. So much for the concerns for mental health. The characteristics of the post-World War II period of increasing life expectancy with each new generation living longer, in better health, under better living conditions, has given way to the opposite. Excess deaths are increasing in every country, including Australia and New Zealand. And both those countries had achieved zero infections and deaths, only to have that record deliberately and brutally overturned by governments, both Liberal and Labor. Life expectancy for the first time in 80 years is falling in many countries, most sharply in the United States. The International Committee of the Fourth International described the pandemic as a trigger event, intensifying the already existing contradictions and crisis of capitalism. That has been confirmed by the experiences over the past two years. The lives of every person on earth has been transformed in one form or other. After all, in the richest country on earth, the United States, one million Americans have perished by COVID and the living and working conditions of of workers in that country bear more resemblance to that of the populations of poorer countries than it does to the wealthy elite of the population within their own. The United States of America cannot guarantee to provide its babies with milk. There is in some states a 90% shortage of baby formula. Parents are being forced to give their infants watered down formula or give them nothing. Why? Because because one of the monopoly corporations which produced baby formula was so unsanitary that it was poisoning babies and had to be closed by the FDA, despite being warned by whistleblowers a year prior. To declare that the United States is a country breaking apart is not an exaggeration. While it can't feed its infants and it won't protect the health and well-being of its population, its school children are raised on protective drills in the event their school is attacked by gunmen. But then they face just as great a danger at the hands of the police forces. These same police departments which along with the military and right-wing fascistic layers, such as the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, were the base for the attempted coup by the then President of the United States, Donald Trump, to overturn the 2020 presidential election and install him as a dictatorial president. The congressional hearings, which have just begun into the coup plot and which have taken 18 months to hold, opened with the words from Representative Benny Thompson, Democrat from Mississippi, who stated bluntly, January 6 was the culmination of an attempted coup, a brazen attempt 
to overthrow the government. It represented Trump's last most desperate chance to halt the transfer of power. He continued, the conspiracy to thwart the will of the people is not over. Two and a half centuries of constitutional democracy are at risk. Well, if this is the case, that Trump organised this, then why is he still at large? Why has he not been arrested? Why did two thirds of the House Republicans vote to not certify the Electoral College vote after the January 6 invasion of the Capitol building? Why has, uh, uh, sorry, um, and what about the role of the sections of the police, military and intelligence services in the standing down of the Capitol Police uh, and others? The Democrats will not answer these questions because, and I quote from our perspective, the response of the Democratic Party prior to, during and after the coup has been determined by the fact that it is far more terrified of exposing the conspiracies to overturn the Constitution than the conspiracies themselves. Its perpetual fear is that any exposure of the rot of American democracy will encourage opposition from below. Throughout the Trump administration, their differences with Trump were centred primarily on issues of foreign policy, and in particular, the demand for more aggressive measures against Russia. The election of the Biden administration has seen that demand for more aggressive measures against Russia carried through. The war in Ukraine against Russia, which was planned, devised, and orchestrated by the US and NATO, is the working out of long-held perspectives to colonise and subjugate Russia and China to the interests of US imperialism. This proxy war threatens to engulf the world in nuclear war. This is not the defence of little Ukraine's right to join NATO, nor is it because Russia fired the first shot. Its aim is and was to capture the vast expanse of raw materials and landmass of Eurasia as the means by which the US resolves its own economic crisis and the loss of hegemony. The inclusion of Finland into NATO has virtually encircled Russia and is designed to provoke it into attacking a NATO country to provide the pretext to expand the war. At the same time as these breathtakingly reckless and dangerous actions are underway in Europe, similar provocations are being waged against China. Oscar will go through these developments in more detail, but in the two weeks since the election of the Albanese government, there has been what can only be described as a frenzied and panicked scurrying by the Prime Minister and Penny Wong, the Foreign Affairs Minister, to Tokyo, uh, to the Pacific Islands twice, and Indonesia. There was a clear message delivered by Biden to Albanese and Wong at the Quad Summit in Tokyo. Labor had to spearhead the campaign against China, a task which it has embraced with gusto. The consequences for the working class in every country is becoming clearer. The desperate and dangerous drive to never-ending war while fulfilling geostrategic requirements is very much bound up with domestic considerations. This is a phenomena in this country as much as in the United States. The purpose is to direct the opposition of the population to an external enemy, to direct the anger out rather than to the actual political forces at home who are producing the crisis. War against the working class abroad, whether it be Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria or Russia, means war against workers at home. The staggering level of expenditure required to fund such a war will be extracted from government expenditure and programs and also from the backs of the working class itself. And what characterises economic life 
in the 21st century is inequality, here and abroad. While the working class, the rural masses and the poor have suffered a profound decline in their conditions of life, the world's rich have seen their wealth double during the pandemic. The transfer of wealth from the central banks to the financial markets in March 2020 dwarfs that which was paid to corporations in the tiny and the tiny ruling elite and rich in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. The constant quantitative easing, which is really just the printing of money, has along with the pandemic and the war provoked the surge of inflation, sparking food shortages, supply chain barriers and interest rate increases that are plunging the world's population into a crisis of unprecedented proportions for almost 100 years. The imposition of such measures against the working class cannot be carried out peacefully or democratically. This is provoking a mass response in the working class internationally, whether it is in the United States, Britain, Europe, Africa, or here. Workers are fighting against the combined impact of decades long decline in real wage levels, the unrelenting workloads and speed ups with rising food costs and increased interest rates, placing the very ability to pay for the basic necessities of life in jeopardy. Nurses, doctors, paramedics and hospital workers have embarked on strike action and protests in response to the intolerable workloads. These conditions were worsened by COVID, but were not created by it. They existed well before the pandemic. The same exists for educators, auto workers, warehouse and postal workers throughout the world. What workers are discovering, however, is that shackled by their unions, and I say unions, not just the union leaders, but the very union organisations themselves, uh, that they cannot take one step forward under their leadership. Workers are constantly blocked by these edifices acting in tandem with Labor and the Greens to prevent workers from breaking free from the confines of Parliament, the state and capitalism. Organisations such as Socialist Alliance and the other pseudo-left groups, whose role it is to prop up the unions and labour, bear special responsibility. They promote the unions as being able to be revived, to be pressured to the left. They have greeted the election of labour as a means of pressuring it to the left. These organisations which previously presented themselves as socialist and opponents of war are now the open defenders of imperialist subjugation of Russia and China and of the subjugation of the working class uh, to labour and, and these organisations. The only means by which workers can break free from these uh, outfits effectively is with an alternative perspective and organisation. The SEP and the International Committee fights for the establishment of independent rank and file committees. Our parties will assist in the building of these organisations and fight for a socialist perspective to guide them. The task is to turn the struggle of workers into, into conscious political movements against capitalism. A central role in that program is the launch of the International Workers' Alliance of Rank and File Committees, which was carried out on May Day of 2021. As explained uh, by Comrade David North, the World Socialist website chairman in his contribution to that meeting, and I'll quote, the aim of this global initiative is to develop a genuine broad-based movement of the international working class and to encourage workers in all countries to break out of the prison-like shackles in which they are confined by the existing state-controlled and anti-democratic unions staffed by right-wing pro-capitalist executives. 
the IWARFC will strive to break down national barriers, oppose all efforts to undermine class unity through the promotion of racial, ethnic and related forms of reactionary middle class identity politics and facilitate the coordination of class struggle on an international scale. It will through these efforts to unify workers across national boundaries contribute mightily toward the creation of a global movement to counteract and prevent the drive for war. It is this perspective which we urge all those in attendance today to take the fight up for, because as Trotsky stated so clearly, again in the transitional program, all talk to the effect that historical conditions have not yet ripened for socialism is the product of ignorance or conscious deception. The objective prerequisites for the proletarian revolution have not only ripened, they have begun to get somewhat rotten. Without a socialist revolution in the next historical period at that, a catastrophe threatens the whole culture of mankind. The turn is now to the proletariat, that is chiefly to its revolutionary vanguard. The historical crisis of mankind is reduced to the crisis of revolutionary leadership. We appeal to you today, anybody who is in attendance at this meeting, to make the decision to join this movement, play your role in the fight to resolve the crisis of revolutionary leadership, the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of a socialist society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl, for that important report, placing uh, the election within its international and really historic context. I think, as you say in your remarks, you know, what characterises economic life in the 21st century worldwide is inequality. And really nowhere is that more sharply reflected than in Sri Lanka. Uh, and with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Deepal Jayasekara, the General Secretary of the SEP in Sri Lanka. Uh, Comrade Jaya Sekera will speak on the serious situation confronting the Sri Lankan working class and rural masses. Uh, and, de and he will detail the critical fight of the SEP, which is the Sri Lankan section of the International Committee of the Fourth International, to provide a socialist way forward for the masses. Uh, Comrade Jaya Sekera's speech will be on the screen in text uh, and so you can follow along. Uh, I very much give a warm welcome, Jaya Sekra. Thanks, Comrade Max. Dear Comrades, I am bringing revolutionary greetings on behalf of the Socialist Equality Party in Sri Lanka to your important public meeting to draw crucial political lessons for the working class from Australia's recently concluded crisis elections. I would like to discuss the extraordinary political situation in Sri Lanka, the sharpest expression of immense economic, political, and social crisis of global capitalism, highly intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic and now US NATO proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. The popular protest movement in Sri Lanka, demanding the resignation of President Gotabe Rajapaksa and his government over skyrocketed prices and shortages of essences like fuel, wind gas, and basic food items, and our stone power outages has now reached its third month. What we have seen is very intense situation of the development of class struggle. The working class has come to play a central role in this popular movement, despite the role of unions in blocking any independent political intervention of workers in this immense crisis of Bhuswa rule. For weeks, unions kept silence on growing popular protests against the Rajapaksa government. Finally, they were forced to call two one-day general strikes on April 28 and May 6 due to the huge pressure from workers. Millions of workers from all sectors, public, private, semi-government and plantation, and also cutting across all communal lines Singhala, Tamil, Muslim, Hindu, and Christian, join these strikes. 
this powerful intervention of the working class has shaken not only the rajapaksa government and all other parties of political establishment but also unions whose aim in calling actions had been contained in the growing opposition among workers yapo unions then withdrew their earlier call for an independent general strike from may 11 this betrayal of unions has emboldened the rajapaksa government to unleash brutal repressive measures against the popular movement on may 9 government instigated goons carried out a violent attack on protesters outside prime minister's residence and golpes green the main protest site in kalamp workers in several sectors including kalambu national hospital and ports and postal department immediately walked out in defense of protesters in opposition to this goon attack in this situation unions were forced to call a general strike again but ended it within two days in may 11 facilitating the rajapaksa government to unleash further repressive measures including imposition of state of emergency and police which hunt against anti government protesters amid growing popular protests of workers youths and rural toilers then prime minister mahinda rajapaksa the elder brother of president was forced to resign president appointed ranil vikramasinghe the leader of right wing united national party ump as the prime minister despite the fact that he is the sole rep- parliamentarian representative in the ump in a statement issued on may 30 the socialist equality party in sri lanka condemned president rajapaksa's appointment of vikram singh as prime minister and warned for this is yet another act by rajapaksa directed against workers youth and the poor who are demanding the ouster of president and his government and end into the social disaster inflicted on them and poor noting immense hardship confronting the working people like acute shortages and increased prices for all basic items and lengthy power cuts our statement said for rajapaksa's new government under vikramasinghe will not address any of these conditions rather it will only worsen them it has been set up to implement the brutal austerity measures dictated by the interstate monitor monetary fund imf and board we advocated an independent revolutionary program for the working class against all the parties of political establishment they are pseudo left hangers on and unions or the president and his new government must go the way forward for the working class is through building action committees mobilizing its industrial and political strength and fighting for socialist policies and so what we have said in our statement has been vindicated by developments since then rajapaksa vikramasinghe government is desperately working to stabilize bourgeois rule and to implement new level of harsh austerity measures dictated by the imf as preconditions for emergency loan the government has requested from it to avert country's current economic turmoil these measures include restructuring of public sector enterprises increase taxes and drastic cuts of the fiscal deficit by slashing government sector jobs wages pensions and remaining subsidies rajapaksa has appointed vikram singh as finance minister to take direct responsibility in quick implementation of those measures as the latest latest example last tuesday addressing the parliament vikram singh reiterated demands that the working class and rural toilers they are the full burden of the unprecedented economic collapse highlighting the severe and worsening economic crisis confronting sri lanka and citing the country's declining harvest of basic food crops in recent months vikram singh insisted that what the people of the whole country should play a role in this effort and what of rebuilding the economy what he meant that working class and rural toilers have to solve the burden of rebuilding the economy and establishing 
economic stability in order to maintain the Rajapaksa Vikram Singh government and Bas in Bhushpa rule. Some of the IMF dictator measures have already been implemented. On June 2, Vikram Singh increased the value added tax VAT from 8% to 12%. The income tax net was also widened, encompassing more sections of the working class. Telecommunication taxes were high and new surcharges were imposed on certain goods. As preparation for cuts in jobs, wages, and other limited benefits of workers, public sector institutions have been instructed to slash their expenditure by various means, including calling only essential staff to workplaces and limiting overtime payments, indicating what has cuts prepared in the public sector at an official meeting held on May 29. Public Administration Ministry Secretary Priyatta Mayadumi warned public sector employees preparing to retire not to ask for pensions and gratuities. Until the economy reaches US dollars 10,000, it means the per capita income level. Projecting destruction of between 50 and 70 percent of current public sector jobs, Mayadumi also complained that. What the maximum bearable number of jobs in the public sector is 500,000 or at most 800,000 import against the current level of 1.7 million. The working class will not passively accept these harsh austerity measures. They have come to struggles against such measures already implemented by the Rajapaksa government. Therefore, New strategic measures will intensify the class struggle. Knowing well about the growing struggles of workers, youth, and rural toilers against new strategic measures, the Rajapaksa Vikram Singh government is moving towards repressive measures and dictatorial forms of rule. This is what really been prepared behind the talks of new 21st Amendment to the country's constitution, which is support to derail class struggle and popular opposition. It will keep widely hated autocratic executive presidency with only limiting some of its powers. Opposition parties, including Tamagin Janabala Vega, JB, Janata Vimti Perman, JVP, and Tamil National Alliance, PNA, are now providing conditional support to the Rajapaksa victim Singh government. They all are backing IMF dictated austerity measures. In the past, they were either partners or supporters of governments with ruthlessly implemented IMF policies. The SKB has criticized the government for not approaching the IMF earlier. The JVP has indicated its basic support to IMF dictated measures, keeping silence over them. Unions are playing a very treacherous role in this situation by preventing any independent movement of the working class and also by backing moves of the parties of the political establishment to trap the struggling workers, youths, and rural toilers within an interim government, that is, alternative Boswa government. What about various solo organizations? They are collaborating with unions in blocking an independent movement of the working class and also working to tie the working class politically to various bourgeois opposition parties. As an example, the frontline socialist party, FSC, a split off from the JVP, has started discussions with opposition parties like the SJB and TNA as an attempt to form an alliance with them. A WSW's article published on May 28, dealing with the FSC said, quote, the FSC has abandoned its previous socialistic phrase mongering, insisting socialism is a task for the distant future, and now offers the false hope of solutions within capitalism by ending corruption and making token reforms. Unquote. In this situation, the CP is fighting to mobilize the working class in an independent revolutionary movement based 
on international socialism against the Rajapaksa supremacy government, all other parties of the political establishment and their agents like pseudo-rep groups and unions. As our Australian comrades are advocating the formation of rank and file committees, we are calling for workers to build action committees in every workplace, factory, plantations, and neighborhood, independent of unions, to lead the struggles of working class for their basic social and democratic rights. The CP has presented a program of policies to animate the work of the action committees to address the pressing needs of the masses. This is the basis for the working class to rally all the press masses, including the rural poor, in the struggle for a government of workers and peasants committed to socialist policies as part of the broader struggle for socialism in South Asia and internationally. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jaya Sekera. Uh, I think that report, as uh, people who are listening can no doubt see that whilst sharply reflected in Sri Lanka, there are parallels here, rising cost of living, demands by the IMF, but then critically also the tasks that are before the working class. Um, and I, I, yeah, so I think it's important uh, report and contribution to today's meeting. Our final speaker today uh, is uh, Oscar Grenfell. Oscar is a member of the uh, Socialist Equality Party's National Committee uh, and the National Convener of the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. He stood as a candidate uh, in the New South Wales uh, in the election uh, for the Senate in New South Wales. He's an extensive writer for the World Socialist website on a range of industrial and political issues, including on Julian Assange and the pro-capitalist policies of the Greens and the pseudo left. So, welcome, uh, Oscar. Thanks, Comrade Max. As the well-known saying goes, a week is a long time in politics. It's now three weeks since the federal election and a tremendous amount has taken place. Above all, the character of the new Labor government has been made crystal clear. It's a right-wing government that represents the banks, the corporations, and the military intelligence establishments of Australia and the United States. During the election campaign, the SEP alone warned that whichever parties took office, their program would be dictated by the global breakdown of capitalism the US confrontations with Russia and China, and the predatory interests of the financial oligarchy. And that's proven to be completely correct in record time. The Labor government's program is a reaction all down the line, war abroad and a war against the working class at home. The election result, as Max raised, demonstrated an historic crisis of the two-party system. The Liberal vote plummeted, but Labor was not the beneficiary. Labor's own primary vote was the lowest since 1934, with the ballot demonstrating a collapse of its previous working class base. In a distorted electoral form, the result showed mass hostility to Labor and the coalition and a growing recognition that there's no fundamental difference between them on any of the major issues. In other words, the incoming Albanese government had no mandate. Labor only scraped into office because its vote fell less than that of the Liberals. For days, it was entirely unclear whether Labor would even have a parliamentary majority. What was the response of the ruling elite to this development? Almost immediately, they, they rallied around Albanese. To cite just one example, Rupert Murdoch's Australian newspaper endorsed Morrison during the campaign. But on May the 22nd, that is a day after, after the election, the Australian welcomed Albanese's victory and falsely claimed that Labor had secured a parliamentary majority almost a week before that actually occurred. The Greens and the Teal Independents, who represent a privileged layer of the upper middle class, declared that they'd work with Labor to ensure parliamentary stability no matter what. Now, there were two factors motivating this reaction. Firstly, it was aimed at covering up what the election itself had revealed. That is an unprecedented crisis of the capitalist political setup that's been in place for 80 years or more under the weight of global developments and a political radicalization 
of workers and young people. And secondly, the pay-ins to certainty and stability serve to create the conditions for Labor to get on with business. Again, the SEP was the only party during the campaign to expose the fact that Labor was seeking to outflank the coalition from the right. On the issue of foreign policy in particular, Labor pitched itself as a more reliable partner for the Biden administration's escalating confrontation with China. That's been one of the central focuses of the new government. Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong were sworn in on May the 23rd, just two days after the election, so that they could go to Tokyo for a meeting of the Quadrilateral Strategic Dialogue on May the 24th. The Quad is the de facto alliance of the four largest militaries in the region, the US, Japan, India and Australia, directed against China. In the lead up to that meeting, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken declared, quote, even as President Putin's war continues, we will remain focused on the most serious long-term challenge to the international order, and that's posed by the People's Republic of China. Now, what Blinken was saying is that the US-NATO war against Russia and the confrontation with China are two fronts in a single conflict. That is the drive by American imperialism to secure domination over the geostrategically crucial Eurasian landmass. At the Quad meeting itself, Biden declared that the US is prepared to go to war with China over control of Taiwan. Albanese and Wong, as their very first acts in office, stressed that they were marching in lockstep with these mad plans, which could result in a third world war. It became very clear after the Quad meeting that the Labor leaders didn't just go uh, for a photo opportunity. They received uh, their marching orders directly from Biden. In the fortnight that followed, Wong was dispatched twice to the Pacific Islands. The first trip to Fiji was just two days after the Quad meeting. It was time to clash with a visit to the Pacific by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Li and was part of a US-Australian campaign to scuttle a regional economic and security framework that China was proposing to the Pacific states. A week after her trip to Fiji, Wong was back uh, in Samoa and Tonga this time. In her public engagements, Wong prattled on about the Pacific family and respect, but the real content of her trips came out very clearly in comments she made in Fiji. Wong said that the Pacific states would face consequences if they turned to China and away from Australia and the US. That is a very clear threat. This was in line with Labor's role during the election campaign. It spearheaded a nationalist hysteria over a security pact between the Solomon Islands and China unveiled in April. And it condemned the coalition for not doing everything possible to sabotage that pact. In other words, Labor is functioning as an attack dog of the US throughout the region. That was also the significance of a trip by Albanese and Wong to Indonesia last weekend, where they again denounced China and Russia and sought to line the Indonesian government up behind the US confrontations. Labor is fully committed to the $600 billion in military spending over this decade, pledged by both parties and to much more. It will deepen AUKUS, the pact with the US and Britain directed against China. As we warned during the election, war abroad goes hand in hand with an onslaught against the working class at home. This connection was very bluntly spelt out by former ASIO director Duncan Lewis last month. He said that defence spending would grow even further to acquire nuclear powered submarines, hypersonic missiles, and other offensive weaponry. And I'll just quote, Lewis said, spending more on defense is obviously gonna impact standard of living and essentially the kind of personal prosperity of Australians. That is uh, guns, not butter. During the campaign, Labor ran on the slogan of a quote unquote better future. It claimed that Australia was on the cusp of an economic recovery and made vague promises 
to address the cost of living crisis and record low wage growth. Again, it's the SEP that alone uh, exposed these lies. We warned that whoever was elected would be tasked with implementing major austerity measures to pay for the trillion dollars in national debt. That is a debt that's largely been accrued through massive handouts to big business during the pandemic. We were the only party that pointed to an international monetary fund assessment in April, which declared that budget repair, that is spending cuts, were on the agenda in Australia. That is the same IMF that is dictating the sweeping attacks on workers in Sri Lanka has called for similar measures to be imposed in this country. It didn't take long for Labor to change its tune entirely. Just days after the election, Labor's Treasurer Jim Chalmers and Finance Minister Katie Gallagher announced a budget black hole. They immediately nominated three initial areas that would require spending cuts. Healthcare, disability services and aged care. All of those are areas that Labor claimed it would boost funding to uh, during the election campaign. Chalmers has repeatedly promised uh, in the pages of the financial press that the deficit will be paid for with spending cuts, not any new taxes on business and the rich. And on the cost of living crisis, the message from the new government is that workers are on their own. They must be prepared to make sacrifices, in Chalmers' words. Official inflation is expected to reach 8% uh, by the end of the year, but real price increases are already far, far higher. What's coming was demonstrated last week when the Reserve Bank increased the interest rate by 0.5%. The financial markets are betting that home mortgage rates will rise by almost three percentage points more by November 2023. That would add almost $1,000 to monthly repayments on an average 25-year variable rate mortgage of half a million, causing uh, enormous financial stress in working class areas. These measures have nothing to do with reducing inflation, which is going to continue because of the US proxy war in Ukraine and the ongoing disruption caused by the pandemic. Instead, the rate rises are part of, part of an offensive against the working class. They're aimed at slowing the economy as a weapon against demands by workers for improved wages. Now, Labor has fully solidarised itself uh, with this agenda. Its submission to the Fair Work Commission the other week didn't even put a figure on a rise for the minimum wage, but it did declare that the Labor government is not in favour of any across-the-board wage increases to match inflation. Instead, the government has insisted that productivity is its priority. The mantra goes that any increases in pay will only be a result of higher productivity. But productivity already rose by 21.6% in the 12 months to March, while wages continued to flatline. What productivity really means is stepped up exploitation, gouging more from each worker to boost corporate profits. And it's the trade unions that will play the decisive role in enforcing this agenda. They've agreed to a summit with the government and big business in September, which will focus on a further pro-business overhaul of workplace relations. The model for this is the tripartite accords of the Hawke Labor government in the 1980s, which plotted the deregulation of the economy and the destruction of whole sections of industry that were not sufficiently profitable. Labor's pro-business agenda will provoke mass opposition in the working class. As Cheryl raised, there's already a movement developing in this country in line with an upsurge of the class struggle around the world. Over recent months, we've seen strikes by nurses, teachers, aged care staff, bus drivers, and disputes involving many other sections of the working class. In each instance, these struggles come up against the trade unions, which are not workers' organisations in any sense of the term. From the 1980s, the unions have functioned as a police force of the employers, suppressing struggles, isolating strikes, and pushing through one sellout deal after another. The unions, above all, are responsible for the record low wages, 
and the social crisis that flows from it. In the election campaign, we advanced our call for workers to form rank and file committees independent of the unions. Such committees are genuine fighting organisations of, by and for workers themselves. They're the only means of breaking the isolation imposed by the unions, uniting the different sections of the working class and organising an industrial and political counter-offensive against the onslaught on wages and conditions. But above all, what we're raising is that the source of all of the issues that workers confront from the pandemic crisis to climate change, the threat of nuclear war and mass poverty stem from a global crisis of the capitalist system. There's no national solution and there's no shortcut. Once again, we've entered into a period of social upheavals like in the first half of the 20th century. The alternatives that are posed are not reform or revolution, but socialism or barbarism. The decisive issue now is building a socialist leadership in the working class. What is required for the working class to go forward are workers in the schools, the hospitals and the factories who are fighting for a socialist alternative and who are able to politically clarify, educate and lead the struggles that are developing. Concretely, that means joining and building the SEP, which I'd urge everyone here to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Comrade Oscar, because your report makes clear, I mean, the agenda of war abroad and war at home uh, is certainly in just three short weeks brought to the fore. Uh, and then it draws out, I think, the essential task for the working class. And I'm sure your report, along with the other two uh, by Comrade Cheryl and Jaya Sekera, have stimulated a lot of thoughts. Uh, you know, a lot of discussion has already, we've already seen in the, uh, in the chat. We very much welcome that. Um, and we also welcome any questions. And we'll now move on uh, to open for answering questions and discussion. Uh, in addition to our, uh, uh, to the uh, speakers uh, who, who I've introduced and uh, to answer these questions, we'll also have um, in our audience the other candidates who are, who are also happy to answer uh, questions. They will, they, those are uh, comrades Mike Head and John Davis, uh, who both stood for the Senate in Queensland, and comrades Peter Byrne and Jason Wardle, who stood in Victoria also for the Senate, uh, so they're here today, also prepared to answer questions. Um, now, I've got uh, a number, I mean, a number of comments have come through and I'll try and uh, characterise them. Uh, and there were comments made on this, on the question of the election itself. Uh, one from Ross saying, assuming universal suffrage works, this was a good election, not a crisis, because the power of fascists is waning. Uh, something that you know, we will respond to. Uh, there was a, another question uh, saying the Black Alliance for Peace in America is becoming a very forceful group of people led by very articulate academics, lawyers, etc. cetera, need something similar here. Uh, and a question from Vicky, uh, can someone explain to me how quantitative easing contributes to inflation but wages don't? There are others, uh, other questions uh, coming through as well uh, and comments on the question of the uh, of the coup itself uh, and uh, and some of the lessons that have drawn out of it. So to answer um, uh, to answer the question uh, or to begin to respond on some of the points on uh, on uh, the coup January six coup, um, I'll call on uh, Comrade Mike, uh, who, as I said before, was our Senate candidate in Queensland, I think you should be able to come on camera here, Mike. Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions and comments relating to the January 6th coup and also uh, to the election result here. Did it reflect a blow against fascism? Um, look, first of all, I would recommend uh, reading the perspective on the World Cyclist website. It's currently on the site. At the moment, it's a statement from our party in the United States, the SEP, which um, makes very clear that it's now undeniable, an undeniable fact after the testimony produced this week that the events of January the 26th last year was a coup attempt. It was an attempt to overturn 
the results of the presidential election and overturn, in that sense, the system of demo democratic voting what's uh, altogether and install a dictatorship under uh, Donald Trump. And as we say, it came very close to succeeding. There was a stand down, effectively, of the military and the police that enabled the um, rioters, the, cons the conspirators, to come within an inch of uh, succeeding, as a matter of fact. Now, first of all, we were the only party that at the time warned that this was, an, this was a coup and was an attempt to establish a dictatorial form of rule in the United States. And that this would signify on a global basis, a very historic turn towards authoritarian rule in the heartland of global imperialism itself. Now that analysis was denied and mocked by uh, all and sundry, particularly the Democratic Party itself, the pseudo left organizations and unions that sat alike around the Democratic Party, and of course within the pages of the corporate media. But the testimony has shown what we explained and what was obvious 18 months ago. And yet, of course, as Cheryl said in her report, Donald Trump remains uh, at large. And more importantly, in some ways, the Republican Party itself, who the majority of whom supported Trump's a coup attempt, even after the, uh, the, the Congress was invaded, they all remain completely untouched as well. In other words, the Democrats' main preoccupation is preventing a movement from the working class against this, uh, this conspiracy. And the Democrats are preoccupied with shoring up the existing congressional order, including uh, the Republicans. As Joe Biden says, we need a, a strong Republican Party. Now, I just think we have to step back. I mean, as the statement on the World Socialist website does, step back and think about the historic implications of this. Um, you know, as Trotsky once said in 1929, you know, the fuses of bourgeois democracy were blowing under the pressure of geostrategic tensions and rising class struggles. And that certainly, that period uh, is here again, only even at a, a higher level. In the 1930s, of course, we saw Capitalism resort to fascist forms of rule in Italy, Spain, and, and Germany. Um, that tendency is returning again because of the staggering levels of inequality which now exist under capitalism and because of the uh, devastation caused by the pandemic, caused by the refusal of capitalist governments to suppress the pandemic, and now, of course, exacerbated further by inflation, which is fueled by the, above all, by the pouring of trillions of dollars into the money markets over the past decade, as I'm sure Nick can explain, Nick Beams can explain uh, in this meeting. And of course, also by the fact that war is now underway in Europe for the first time on a large scale since World War II, um, which is you know, disrupting, uh, which is causing in Sri Lanka and around the world, extraordinary surges of, of and shortages of food and fuel, which is provoking uh, not only enormous suffering, but also, uh, you know, enormous struggles, uh, you know, by workers and, 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 and the poor. Um, now, again, just to make a point, this is not something separate from Australia. Australia is not a, you know, a unique exception. As, as is always put forward in the, uh, in the political and media establishment. Uh, in fact, in 1975, we saw a taste of this when the Whitlam government, the elected Labor government, was removed, not because Whitlam was a threat to capitalism at all or, or, or to America or anything else. He was a supporter of the US bases in Australia, a supporter of uh, the alliance with the United States, but he had failed to completely control or control enough the enormous upsurge of the working class, which occurred here, as it did around the world, in that period of 1968 to 1975. Now, the fact that the facade of, 
of parliamentary democracy was torn aside in 1975, you know, is a warning that this, the, this could certainly happen here as well. Um, now, the, and the fact, as, as uh, Max explained in the introduction to the meeting, the fact that the vote for the two parties of capitalist rule, uh, traditional parties of capitalist rule, collapsed so much in this election is another indication that the existing forms of rule are breaking apart. Now, so you have a government elected with only a third of the vote, with its vote falling. Now, and it has to undertake the task, as, as Oscar and Cheryl explained, of unleashing uh, war and, you know, austerity uh, on the working class. Now, that's a recipe for enormous social and political explosions, which can't be contained democratically. The ruling class here, like in the United States, will turn more and more to uh, democratic, to anti-democratic and authoritarian forms of rule. Now, is the election of a Labour Party government, like the Democrats in America, does that mean fascism has been forestalled? No, it doesn't. Well, the opposite, as a matter of fact, you know, this Labour government, like, the Demo like Biden's administration in America, will seek to stifle, suppress, strangle the opposition of the working class, which in its own way only opens the way, paves the way for right-wing populists like Trump and fascistic elements to take advantage of that. Of that. So I think, um, you know, the only way forward is the, is the path that our party internationally and in Australia is advocating. That is the independent organisation of the working class through rank and file committees and the turn towards a socialist program for, for genuine democracy, which actually means the control of the working class over the means of production uh, and, and uh, to reorganise social and economic life for the benefit of all, not the tiny wealthy elite, which as Cheryl pointed out, you know, their wealth is rising astronomically compared to the rest of the population. So I just make those... Um, uh, make those points. I hope that helps. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have uh, questions really flooding in, um, which I will read out before I call on the next speaker to answer a question so, you know, our, our speakers can think about how they answer them. Um, there was uh, a question here, how people are coping with the rising costs and what they think, this was from Mag, sorry, how, how are people, uh, sorry, how people are coping with the rising costs and what they think Labor will do re ever rising inflation, and at what level of inflation is breaking breaking point for people? Is a question, uh, and then a follow up question: uh, What the participants? What do the participants think Labor will do uh, on the question of the release of Assange? Uh, and one more question: What do rising interest rates and rents mean for the housing and homelessness crisis? Uh, what are the SEP policies? Now, on the question that came up earlier on qu uh, quantitative easing, uh, which was from Vicky. Can someone explain to me how quantitative easing contributes to inflation, but wages increases don't? There's a follow-up comment uh, from Peter S. How does driving the economy into recession by increasing interest rates to stifle demand reduce inflation? As ruling class economists claim, since both sides of this leisure equal the destitution of the working class by different means. Now, to answer these I think, uh, you know, critical questions. I will call on comrade Nick Beams, uh, who many of you may recognise from his extensive writing on the world economy on the World Socialist website. He too is a founding member of the SLL. Uh, and so I'll call on Nick to, to answer that question. Go ahead, Nick, you should be able to speak. To explain this question, we need to uh, go into a little bit of history. But history comes up very naturally in the course of the discussion, because one of the things you hear about the present crisis is we can't let it go back to the 1970s and what happened there. So we need to, to do that. What happened in the 1970s was an enormous crisis of capitalism uh, brought about by the ending of the post-war boom, above all underpinned by decline in profit rates, which led to inflation, and that inflation spurred what were, in essence, revolutionary struggles of the working class around the world, in the United States, in Australia, France, uh, elsewhere. Now, 
with the aid of the trade union and labor bureaucracies, and that crisis produced a coup in Australia, it was serious, as Mike has referred to. What allowed the ruling class to stabilize the situation was the role of the trade union and labor bureaucracies all around the world, which suppressed the struggle and allowed the bourgeoisie to continue. But it didn't, under, it didn't solve the underlying crisis. And so at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, measures were undertaken to do that. They were spearheaded uh, in the United States by the actions of Paul Volcker, the head of the central bank, Reagan and Thatcher governments, lifted interest rates to 20%, caused massive destruction uh, of whole sections of industry and were aimed at a sort of reconstruction of the US and global economy. And we had the effects of that, whole industries closing down and so on. United States, Britain, Australia, all the advanced capitalist countries. But it didn't restore the conditions of the post-war period. In fact, there was a kind of new mode of profit accumulation took place. We have from the beginning of the 80s, the rise of finance, the making of profit, not through establishing factories, opening up new industries, developing in that way, but above all through financial manipulation. But this itself led to a crisis in 1987, uh, when we had the largest single day fall of the Wall Street in history, 22.3%. And it was very significant, the response of the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. Alan Greenspan, the then chair, put out a statement, a one-line statement on the day of that crash, October the 19th, 1987, saying the Federal Reserve will provide liquidity to all market participants. This was the start of pumping in money into the stock market, the financial system, to prevent a collapse. And that went on through the 80s, developed to new heights in the 1990s into the early 2000s. But that it, that. Uh, measures, those measures themselves, they low every time there was a, a financial crisis, and there were quite a few in the 1990s, the Fed would lower the interest rates, pump more money in. But what this did was create an enormous financial bubble, which collapsed in the crisis of September 2008, when Lehman Brothers, the investment bank, went broke. The response of the US Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world, but particularly the US one, was to pump money into the financial system. Before 2008 crisis, the Fed had on its uh, books assets worth about $800 million. After 2008, that leapt to $4 trillion. Now, what did they say? They said this is a temporary measure. Normal conditions will be restored as soon as the economy is, you know, righted, as soon as we get back to normal, these emergency measures will be withdrawn. That day never came. In fact, every time they did make quite limited attempts to do that, the markets basically uh, threw a tantrum and uh, the Fed had to back off. So money was continually pumped in to the system to finance the speculation that had taken place. And it was quite literally speculation of a criminal character. I only have to quote the words of Carl Levin, uh, the uh, chairman of the Senate committee, which examined uh, the 2008 crisis. They prepared a report in 2011, or at least the staff did. It said that the financial markets were a snake pit of conflicting interests and greed. I read some of that report. You could only draw the conclusion that Goldman Sachs, the major investment, one of the major investment bankers in the United States, was nothing short of a criminal enterprise. But so the money was never withdrawn. The speculative bubble continued. And then COVID came in March 2020. Now, scientific response dictated that the way to deal with that was public health measures to close down infected cities, sections of industry to pay compensation to workers who were affected, uh, and so on. Not uh, radical socialist measures, actually bourgeois public health measures known for centuries. 
as to how to deal with this. They were never implemented. And the reason is very simple and very clear. To have implemented such measures would have meant a collapse of the markets. And that's in fact what took place. In March 2020, we had another financial crisis because Wall Street feared, particularly in response uh, to workers in the United States and elsewhere who demanded that that's public health measures be undertaken, Wall Street underwent an enormous plunge. And uh, we had at the same, the response to that of the ruling class and particularly the Fed was to pump in still more money. They'd pumped in $4 trillion after 2008. A further four to $5 trillion was pumped in to prop up the markets. That is to give essentially free money to the Wall Street investment houses, the speculators, the hedge funds, the stock funds, and so on. And over the last two years, we've seen record rises, the doubling of wealth for people like Bezos and Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, the global elites, I can't go through all the figures here, but have essentially doubled their wealth, in some cases tripled their wealth, uh, as a result of this stock market boom, which took place no less in this country. It was part of the same process. The RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, did the same thing here. Now, that has enormously lifted asset prices, particularly for housing, uh, stocks, financial assets, and so on. Now, what is the situation with regard to wages? In this time, well, just before I come to that, we the refusal to take action on COVID, you know, had its effect. They said, well, we can't do anything about COVID because it'll affect the markets. But COVID did affect the real economy. Workers couldn't go to work. Supply chains became snarled. And combined with the pumping in of money, this set off an inflationary spiral, which was now has now been exacerbated by the NATO, US-led uh, NATO war against Russia. Now, what about wages? Well, facts are stubborn things. If wages are the, and, and the ruling class always, you know, talks about wages being the cause of inflation, well, in fact, all around the world, not just in the last six months or the last year, but over the past decades, and particularly the last 20 years, real wages have declined. As a proportion of national income in relation to profit, they've declined. So what is this mantra about we've got to stop wages going up all about? It's to impose this developing crisis of the whole financial system onto the backs of the working class. And the aim of lifting inflation, uh, lifting interest rates, is to create recessionary conditions in the economy so that workers who are demanding compensation for their daily cuts in living standards, every time you go into a shop, you take a wage cut. That's the daily reality, not just over months or six months or a year, but every day. Petrol prices up every day, hundreds of dollars being added to family bills for fuel, for cars, for electricity, 18% this year anticipated. It's to suppress those wage demands, to continue the boost in profits, and to use these measures as a bludgeon against the working class, combined with the actions of the trade union bureaucracy in suppressing uh, wage, uh, wage claims and driving down the living standards of the working class to unprecedented proportions. And what do they fear? They fear what they feared in the 1970s, and this is why they continually refer back to it, that the struggle of the working class to maintain its living standards provokes a revolutionary crisis, as it did, as it did 50 years ago. So the crucial question is enormous struggles are coming. A leadership must be prepared to lead those struggles, and that's why uh, we're calling on everyone here to take their part, make the decision, become a fighter for socialism in the working class. Look, thank you. Thank you, uh, Comrade Nick. As 
many said, I think, a, a, a really critical and clear explanation. There was a question, I mean, will this uh, be something that will be uh, available? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we make all of the, the public meeting recordings available. We'll publish it on the World Socialist website. Um, uh, there are some questions that have come in uh, and continue to come in, keep them coming. Um, one that's come in, and I'll just read out uh, from uh, Eileen, I agree, Mike, but how do you get members of left-wing parties to actually agree on anything was the question following your remarks. But while comrades are thinking on those questions and preparing their answers, I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to everyone in this meeting to donate to our election fund. Uh, we have launched a $50,000 election fund which we have raised throughout our campaign and, our pre and at our previous public meetings in which we have received generous support. The reason for the fund is because standing candidates uh, in an election is extraordinarily expensive. This is, entire, this is bound up entirely with the anti-democratic uh, nature of the elections in Australia. Um, even the cost uh, of just the nomination fees for candidates doubled this year. Uh, we have used this fund to boost our social media posts, to print and distri distribute our election statements, to the transport of our, uh, of our candidates, and our only source of funding comes from you, ordinary people, our supporters, workers, and our electoral members. I know many of you at this meeting uh, have come to others and have given before, but we ask to give generously again. We don't get state funding and we wouldn't accept state funding or sponsorship from corporations. Uh, the source of all of our resources is from you, as I said, ordinary people and workers. So I appeal today to make as generous donation as possible so we can complete this fund. Uh, think about how much uh, of a donation you can make. Pledges can be made today, as you can see on your screen, um, or uh, at the end of the month. Uh, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, if you're international, that is, you don't live in Australia, uh, you can donate to the WSWS on the WSWS.org. Uh, I'll call now on uh, Comrade John. Uh, he was a, a candidate uh, in a, running in the Senate in Queensland. As I said before, he's a member of uh, the National Committee uh, and uh, of the International Students, Students for Social Equality. He's the president of our club in Newcastle. So... I'll call on uh, Comrade John to answer, who will give some answers to the, the questions that have come up. Uh, thank you, Max. Um, look, I, I think it's been a very, very important discussion. Just, just to deal with uh, some of the issues or questions that have come up, um, well, first of all, what do rising interest rates and, and rents mean for the uh, housing and, and homelessness crisis and what are the Socialist Equality Party's policies uh, towards that? I think it's a very good question. Uh, as many would be aware, earlier this week, the Reserve Bank of Australia lifted its base interest rate by 0.5 percentage points, uh, which is the biggest single hike in 22 years, uh, and lifting the current cash rate to 0.85%. Uh, this is up from the record low interest rate of just 0.1% uh, just over a month ago. Now, what this really means... Uh, rising interest rates, frankly, threaten a catastrophic consequences for many working class households. Uh, this week's decision alone will add $133 a month on a loan, uh, which would be worth uh, $500,000 over 25 years, and uh, $265 per month on one worth that was worth uh, $1 million. In the state of New South Wales, where the average 25-year uh, loan is uh, 786000 the increase in uh, monthly payments will be around $211. Now, this uh, it has been estimated that if the bank uh, increases its base rate to 2.5% uh, by the end of the year, uh, home buyers, um, which have already been battling with the uh, Escalating uh, house prices, which which uh, this year uh, surpassed the median house price across the country, surpassed a million dollars across the country. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know they will, uh, on average, will have to find an extra one thousand dollars a month 
on, on mortgage repayments, uh, which is the equivalent, frankly, of a $250 per week uh, cut in disposable income. Uh, uh, it was analyst uh, Martin North, who was the principal of digital finance analytics, uh, who told the ABC last month that uh, 1.5 million uh, households with a mortgage were already in financial stress. Uh, and what he meant by that was uh, he defined that as spending more than they earn. He also told the Daily Telegraph uh, earlier this week that even a lift in the RBA's rate uh, to just 2% would increase the proportion of households in mortgage stress from 44%, uh, which is where it currently stands, to uh, around 50% and perhaps more. Uh, North said that uh, the um, more than 50, 4 million households out of, net, out of nearly 10 million are already close to the edge, which is an unprecedented uh, situation. And if the RBA added another 2% to its base rate, a further 400,000 to 500,000 would probably fall into the stress category, uh, which would take the total to nearly half of all households uh, with a mortgage. Um, <clears throat> now, just on the rate hikes itself, these are part of an international process. The, the central banks, including the RBA here, are implementing the hikes. Now, the, the official sort of stated reason for the rate hike is the need to bring down inflation. Now, as everyone's probably familiar with, the, the official rate of inflation is running around 5.1% uh, and is expected to go much higher in coming months. But the, the real reason, and, and Nick went through this, the, the real reason is to drive down wage claims uh, by workers who, who face the highest inflation in, in a, uh, for the better part of 40 years where real wages have been cut over the past few decades. Moreover, and this is also uh, serious, the, these interest rate hikes do threaten to set off a financial meltdown, uh, which would be akin to the 2008-2009 uh, global financial crisis, which was triggered by the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States. Now, a central component of the collapse of the US bubble was the sharp divergence between house prices and real wages. And these conditions are emerging very sharply here in Australia. And you know, while housing costs are reaching astronomical heights, real wages are stagnating and, and declining. Um, and this sort of segues into the question that, that Mag's raised on the question of what, what's the response of the Labor government. And I think uh, one can already see that last Friday, not, the, not this past Friday, but one before that, uh, in a new submission to the uh, Fair Work Commission, which is the Australia's pro-business industrial tribunal, uh, the Australia's Labor government opposed any across-the-board pay rise for workers in line with inflation. And regardless of the cost of living, uh, and even, even for the worst paid workers, um, which would, uh, on the minimum wage of $20.33 an hour, and there are many who are in casual jobs who sometimes subsist on less than that. And the government refused to nominate any such pay rise to match the official inflation rate of 5.1%, of um, let alone the 6.6% rise uh, on non-discretionary costs, such as food uh, and fuel, and including housing. Um, so, you know, one has to say in the few weeks since the election, they've all of a sudden discovered a sort of dire economic conditions and, and uh, after the election and Albanese's government is now demanding sacrifices uh, from workers. Uh, Treasurer Jim Chalmers uh, said there was a budget black hole and he identified that there need to be cuts to health care, the cuts to the NDIS, cuts to aged care. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> You know, in, in effectively, the Labor government is placing uh, this into the hands of the uh, Fair Work Commission, what that means is that the government is laying the foundations for yet further pay cuts for millions of workers. Um, you know, this, it is, this tribunal uh, was established by the last Rudd-Gillard Labor government of 2007 to 2013, and, and it's played a major role in the suppression of the class struggle, suppression of, of strikes, um, and, and wages and conditions. 
Now, just on just on our policies, <clears throat> just to, also on this throughout the election campaign, uh, Labor leader Anthony Albanese he he pledged to build what was uh, thirty thousand social housing properties over the next five years. Now, let's break that down for a sec. Um, this is a drop in the bucket compared to what is really required, um, you know, for to ensure that you know people have a, for access to affordable housing. Uh, just even on the question of public housing itself, the, the, there's been a massive decrease over the past um, over the past 40 years. Uh, where in 1980, uh, approximately 20% of all houses built in this country were public housing. That rate is now that is now around four <clears throat> percent. So many have been just cancelled. How many just cannot access public housing uh, and, and affordable and good quality public housing for that matter? But you know what would be required to resolve the crisis. There was a, a Deloitte report uh, commissioned by the Western Sydney uh, Leadership Dialogue Think Tank, uh, which found that uh, in New South Wales alone, uh, there would be required 316,000 uh, new public homes by in New South Wales alone by 2036. Um, and then there was another comment by a professor of urban policy, Jago Dodson, uh, last month, who told the Saturday paper that any sort of effective uh, measure for providing affordable housing, he would say, he's, and I quote, it would take another 730,000 dwellings to meet demand uh, as measured by the waiting list for public housing at the moment. And that would require an investment of about $5 billion a year for the next 20 years, uh, unquote. Now, the we're the, we're the only... Uh, party uh, which is advancing a program to address the uh, the housing crisis. Um, in our election statement, uh, we insisted that there had to be a vast expansion of public housing, uh, you know, to end homelessness as part of a pro as part of a broader program to provide affordable housing for all. Now, this what this would require uh, is the pouring in of tens of billions of dollars into the public housing rather than into the uh, pockets of billionaires who currently dominate the property development industry. Uh, there must be massive expansion, uh, not just public housing, but there needs to be substantial wage rises, far in excess of the cost of living increases, uh, and a decent, uh, well-paid job for all those who wish to work. And all the sort of banks and corporations, including the housing sector, must be placed under public ownership and democratic workers' control. Uh, I'll just make those points. I'll now call on the next uh, uh, speaker to answer the question. This is Comrade Peter Byrne, who was our Senate candidate uh, in Victoria, uh, who will answer the question that uh, Eileen raised uh, on the question of uh, left-wing party unity. So uh, I'll call on you, uh, Comrade Peter. Thanks, Max. Look, um, yeah, so Eileen said, how do you get members of uh, left-wing parties to actually agree on anything? And, and I think a related question was David asking, why do we spend so much money running for elections in capitalist parliaments? Um, you know, one of the, the reasons the Socialist Equality Party stood in the, um, in the election is to take our program to the working class. As everyone knows, the ability of uh, the Socialist Equality Party to get um, TV coverage or, you know, coverage in the mainstream media um, is virtually um, non-existent due to the domination of the media by um, capitalist um, companies. So everything that we do has to be done independently. And, you know, through the collection we just raised, through the sacrifice that the working class makes to, um, to fund this party. We said in our election statement, which, um, you know, I think was a really key part of the development of our campaign, where we outlined in a very concise form the policies on which we were standing. Um, we said we are irreconcilably opposed to every other party the Liberal National Coalition, the Labor Party, the Greens, United Australia Party and pseudo-left parties such as Socialist Alliance and the Victorian Socialists, as well as the array of so-called independent candidates who seek to curry favour with the major parties or within the framework of the political establishment. All of them stand for the defence of the profit system. Look, a number of comments from the uh, discussion at today's meeting have referred to the fact that, you know, in a sense, socialism or the policies that we're advocating are a no-brainer. And if you take that position, then we'll, why are we at you know, 2022 in history with the um, development of war 
and um, you know, deepening attacks on the working class. Why don't we have socialism? Well, the, the biggest impediment to that, as um, Cheryl began the meeting um, with, was the question of um, leadership, the uh, resolution of the crisis of proletarian leadership. Um, and one of the biggest problems in, in overcoming that hurdle is the confusion that's created by parties which claim to be socialist or left wing um, uh, who, who operate in the working class essentially to maintain capitalism. And particularly amongst those in this election uh, were Victorian Socialists and Socialist Alliance. Um, and again, reading from our um, election statement, we said, far from being socialists in any sense, they represent the interests of an upper middle class layer steeped in the divisive and regressive politics of identity based on race and ethnicity, sexuality and gender. And, you know, there's certainly the the Victorian socialists, their whole stated aim through the um, through the election was to form an electoral basis um, that they could then um, use to get a member uh, at the Victorian state elections due in November this year into um, into um, uh, the Victorian upper house um, par uh, parliament. So their their aim is to get a seat at the table of a capitalist parliament in order to put pressure. On essentially the Labor Party and try and you know put some pressure on the Labor Party to in, implement some left wing policies. As we've analysed, the Labor Party is seen by millions of workers as a big business party and cannot be reformed. So the question, therefore, is why would you put forward in the working class such a policy to try and trap workers within the framework of the Labor Party and the trade unions and really prevent them from developing the necessity of a building a revolutionary party? Um, so in that sense, you know, the Socialist Equality Party fights for that delineation for the independence of the working class. And in that sense, we, we um, you know, while we're, we're happy to accept anyone who agrees with those principles to join our party, we, not, we understand very clearly that the, um, the other so-called socialist parties like Victorian Socialists and Socialist um, Alliance and, and uh, Socialist Alternative, which makes up Victorian Socialists, they very much stand for the defence of capitalism and for the, the maintenance of the system. And there, they have a, a reformist perspective, that is that the system can be reformed. Um, they actually said in relationship to the Victorian Parliament, they said um, they wanted to have a voice in the mainstream debate defending Victorian State Labor Premier Dan Andrews from all the lunatic attacks from the right wing. In other words, you know, they want to act as a, a sort of left flank of the Labor Party to try and tie the working class to ultimately the the two main parties and um, the capitalist um, framework itself. So, look, you know, we uh, in in um, in this election meeting. I mean, we we um, uh, you know thank everyone who participated in our election campaign in distributing this really critical election statement. But you know, uh, now the election's over. You know, the main task now is the building and development of this party in the working class, and you know, taking forward that political struggle. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Jason Wardle, uh, who was also running on the Senate ticket uh, in Victoria uh, in our election. Uh, Jason is answering one of the questions that came up earlier. Uh, what is the situation facing young workers and students under the Labor government? What answers does the SEP offer? So I'll hand over uh, to Jason. Yeah, thanks, Max. So, I mean, first of all, the conditions are pretty, quite obviously very harsh. The, working, the youth and the working class here are no exception to any international processes as has been explained um, in other speeches that they, they, they've undergone over a decade um, now of pretty extreme casualisation rates. Um, you know, under 25-year-olds are less likely to be employed with bachelors and higher degrees. Um, so this is, it's, it's difficult to put, pin down every element. I mean, there's housing crisis that's occurring, homelessness um, of the youth of, you know, uh, what you call indigent workers and things like this. So when we look at the uh, election results, so Oscar has pointed out that there was actually the lowest uh, results on record at 68%. It's good to put that into context. I mean, the last election, they had 74%, and that was considered the lowest on record. Before that, um, back in like Howard's period, you know, these despised coalition governments, um, they still had something like 81% of the vote between the two major parties. So when we look at 68% um, going down, you know, year by year, we're seeing uh, a massive fracturing 
you know, it, it is really a historic crisis. Like they, they didn't have a minority government in many, many decades until the Gillard election. Now they've just basically scraped through um, again. I think another important statistic in regards to the election was the fact that I think it's the first time a government has gained power with a, a, a falling vote um, at 33%. So taking this into account, well, how do we put the youth into that context? Um, I would argue that they are leading the, uh, the the general sentiment against the political establishment. We've seen many surveys that have come out and said uh, around 2% of them believe that the that any of these parties represent the interests of the population. Um, and others have argued that something like 50% of them believe COVID was the major issue and it wasn't even brought up. So the, the conditions of the youth that are being exacerbated day by day and year by year by inflations, pandemics, lockdowns, all of these, and again, climate change, they're massively um, affected by, they come out in tens of thousands um, you know, to, to make a difference and then are basically ignored by the political establishment. Um, the, the, this is going on um, oh, in the media and on the surface, but we really have to understand that there is a fervour going on underneath that's not being reported on. Um, the youth are radicalising. You can see it on the campuses day by day. We get you know, unprecedented amounts of people signing up to the party. We go to La Trobe, we get six, eight, we've got 17 people one day um, signing up and, you know, this is this is a massive turn. Um, so it, this has to be put into an international context as well. Otherwise, it's really just seen as uh, something that can be right. It, it, there is There are always questions about getting, you know, left-wing parties and shifting the, the policies of mass pressure and things like this. Um, but look, what has Labor done since they've been in power? Within three hours, they um, were flying off to Japan to just solidify this quad alliance, this international alliance that they've um, set up over the last decade, that they've, um, you know, they've gone to Fiji, uh, they've gone to Samoa and Tonga. These are the first things they handled uh, um, and responded to. It was not, now you're looking at cuts in healthcare. You know, they, they didn't come in and say, we're going to raise them in wage. They're, they're arguing that if Fair Work says something, some Millie Mouse thing that Albanese puts forward um, and they know it's going to fail. And Albanese and, and uh, you know, his ministers had a meeting um, not long after the election, a unity meeting where it was, it was uh, you know, emphasised uh, that they had to be on the same front with these savage cuts they are going to implement, you know, these austerity measures. Um, and again, this has hit the youth incredibly you know, hardly, uh, uh, you know, strongly over the last decade. It's only going to intensify their um, uh, education costs are skyrocketing, They're going up year by year. It just uh, it has to be understood on this fundamental level that then they're not going to turn this inflationary. Uh, issue around and they're not going to address any of these things so what do we do um we certainly don't argue that we have to join other you know left-wing parties or fuse them together or anything like this Let, let's just look at their their records i mean vic socialists spent the entire election as was um you know outlined uh horse trading and you know gerrymandering different districts uh campaigning in the wealthiest areas um essentially trying to broach what the greens are you know, their areas and stuff. They, and the whole, we listen to them day by day on polls and stuff. Um, their whole strategy was to direct everyone back behind Labor. There's not a single element of socialist or, um, you know, working class analysis or anything like this. Um, so we do argue that we need to create and build the party, which is uh, the independent organisation of the working class and the youth come under that. The IYSSC is an international youth of students and for social equality. Um, it's the youth and students. It's international. It's kind of self-explanatory, but it does take a bit of time to get used to. We aren't, um, when we have these regionals and meetings nationally, uh, Fridays and Saturdays on weekends and stuff, we aren't just doing it for the sake of our party. We're seeking to, to connect workers 
uh, here and internationally um, so they can understand their interests. Uh, so that's the way forward for the working class and for the youth. We go out to campuses and such. And obviously, it's not limited to students. We are trying to um, intervene more in Coles and Amazon and places that young people work at um, so we can get them involved as well. The rank and file committees come under this. So that's the way forward. That's what we need to fight to do. We need. It starts with the education of the working class through our program, through our interventions. Um, but then we need people to join. We need people to turn this around and explain that there's a whole laundry list of issues um, that are facing them, but they aren't going to be able to respond to it or, or even really comprehend how they connect um, on a fundamental level unless we you know, take up the struggle. Uh, thank you, Jason. I can see there are numbers of questions still coming in and we will do our best to, to try to get to as many as we possibly can in the time that allows. Uh, and the next speaker uh, will be uh, Comrade Oscar who will answer uh, some of the questions that have come up. So I hand over for Oscar. Yeah, I'll just make a couple of quick points on the question that was raised about what Labor will do uh, in relation to Assange. I, think, I mean, the answer is that they'll do nothing to defend him um, and they'll continue Australia's participation in the US-led uh, campaign to destroy Assange, to destroy WikiLeaks uh, for exposing American war crimes. That's already very clear uh, the first three weeks in office. You know, both Albanese and Wong have been asked on several occasions what their position is on Assange Um the entirety of Albanese's response to that question was, uh, I'm not going to engage in loud hailer diplomacy. Um, I mean, he said literally nothing else. Uh, but then much more revealing was Penny Wong's response to a similar question. She said, uh, we'll provide a sign for support just as uh, the coalition and government and, and Scott Morrison did. I mean, it sort of brings... Brings to mind the phrase, you know, support him like a, a rope supports a hanging man. Of course, the coalition um, was intensely hostile to it. Assange did nothing to advance the fight for his freedom and, and collaborated with the campaign against him. And that's always been the line of the entire political establishment here. I think it should always be recalled. It was the, the Labor government of Julia Gillard uh, in which Albanese, Wong and others were, were prominent representatives which initiated uh, Australia's participation in the attacks on Assange. It was Gillard in 2010 who inf infamously said that Assange was, was guilty of crimes under Australian law, completely false, uh, threatened to tear up his passport and pledged to assist the, the US intelligence agencies in their camp campaign against him. I mean, that that's the record of Labor. Historically, they've been the most uh, vociferous of the establishment parties in, you know, attacking Assange, WikiLeaks, as part of their um, complete support for, for a broader onslaught on democratic rights. I think, you know, just quickly, it's very clear that this is bound up with, you know, major foreign policy questions. Uh, I mean, this is a, a Labor government which is functioning as an attack dog of the Biden administration, uh, ramping up the preparations for war with China every day. Under those conditions, um, Assange is anathema. You know, they're persecuting him, uh, not only as, as retribution for what he and WikiLeaks did, but also to um, send a message to those who are opposing the, the far greater war crimes that are being prepared today. So I think all of that underscores the fact that the fight to free Assange requires a political fight against the Labor government. I mean, we continue to demand that the Australian government do, you know, what it can and what it's obliged to, which is use all of its diplomatic and legal powers to secure Assange's freedom. That's what they did with Peter Grester, uh, belatedly with David Hicks and in numbers of, of other instances. Um, but they'll only do that if they're forced to do so by a mass movement of the working class. Um, so certainly we warn against any illusions, you know, in Albanese labour on the question of Assange or any other issue um, 
the, the decisive question is, is the independent mobilisation of the working class. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, next to answer some of the questions that have come up is uh, Cheryl. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, I mean, I'll only answer the, the question in regards to the Black Alliance for Peace uh, that was uh, asked much earlier in the, um, in the meeting. Now, there's numbers of issues bound up with this, and I hope to do it uh, to, to be able to deal with it in, in uh, the time that I have and do it justice. <clears throat> um, I mean, first of all, the, the issue of peace, or more to the point, the issue of war, uh, is, is a feature, is an uh, element of the mechanism of so not just capitalism, but we are discussing capitalism, uh, of working out and resolving the what has been unresolved in the forms of rule, the forms of uh, the uh, development of the relationship between different capitalist co governments, uh, different formations. Uh, I think as uh, Clausewitz uh, said, War is politics by other means. The, the, the basis of war is capitalism. While capitalism exists, there is always the danger of war. The concept of either the League of Nations, the United Nations, uh, uh, the, the pressure on, of uh, appealing to capitalist governments for peace, are not just futile, but entirely bankrupt and uh, uh, designed to, to channel the, the uh, underlying opposition of the working class, of the masses to war. Because, of course, it is uh, in, in, when push comes to shove in the final analysis, it is the working class uh, that pays the ultimate price for uh, the, 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 the uh, different capitalist governments undertaking uh, war against each other. Um, the, the, I mean, and, and the uh, demonstrations, the protests which were uh, carried out in 2003, these were the largest, the most widespread uh, protests throughout the world. Um, I mean, in history, um, far, far uh, larger than the, the demonstrations against the Vietnam War, um, they fell on deaf ears. These were, um, th this was the sentiment of broad sections. Uh, certainly there were sections of the working class, but, but broadly of these were predominantly middle class movements or led by middle class organisations and, uh, and layers. <clears throat> the only means by which uh, war can be averted is through the overthrow of capitalism. That task is the task which falls to the working class. And I think as the International Committee has, has highlighted, the, uh, the, the movement, the, the movement and the development of a movement against war that we are fighting for will be led by the working class. It, it will, it is, and our orientation, our, the, the uh, class to which we fight to mobilise is the working class. I think it, the, uh, the issue, therefore, uh, and, and as, as our speakers and, and uh, candidates have raised, uh, the, the development of war is utilised, as it is in regards to the, uh, the war in Ukraine, <clears throat> as the mechanism of one section of, of the capitalist class, of the ruling class of particular nations, uh, to overcome their own internal, both economic, uh, geostrategic and domestic crises. That is certainly what is, is bound up. Uh, 
and was bound up in in regards to the war in Afghanistan, the war on terror, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the war now being developed against Russia and against China. It cannot be overcome uh, by appeals, by uh, protestations of peace um, that, that never has and it won't uh, be uh, uh, it won't be achievable now. The fact that this organization, the Black Alliance for Peace, was established in 2017, I think also has to be highlighted. This was part of a turn particularly uh, by the Democratic Party, I mean sharply by the Democratic Party, uh, to, to uh, orient any opposition which existed um, certainly to uh, the, the impact of, of the, uh, the, the economic crisis which was developing certainly very sharply in the United States but also internationally into the channel of identity politics. Um, I mean, one only really, quite frankly, has to look at who were the, the central figures in the Bush administration who spearheaded the, the uh, campaign and the fight and the, and the demand for war. You had Colin Powell who got up in front of the United Nations uh, and put forward the, the program, the lie of weapons of mass dis destruction, which purportedly Gaddafi uh, had in, in Iraq, which was a lie. He knew when he put it forward, it was a lie. That was then followed, uh, and he was the first Black American Secretary of State. That was, he was then followed by Condoleezza Rice, the second black American and the first female black American as the Secretary of State, who carried on his role uh, in the, the prosecution of war, uh, certainly in the Middle East, uh, against Iraq, against Afghanistan uh, and, and uh, Syria and other countries, um, and also the provocations certainly which were being waged against North Korea. Um, would it have been, and it certainly wasn't different, that there were uh, black representatives of the Republican Party that undertook this? They, they uh, did not um, uh, resile from the requirements of the, the, uh, uh, the Bush administration, nor of the, the ruling class in the United States. But what it, it was designed to do and, and what, it, what the whole program and, and perspective of identity politics is to pit different sections of the working class against each other, black, black workers against white, Aboriginal workers against uh, white workers, uh, Hispanic, and it goes on and on. Um, and, of course, it is particularly sharp uh, with the Me Too movement that also came into existence uh, in 2017 um, and that this was the, the attempt, particularly by sections of the upper middle class, the particularly uh, wealthy sections of, of the middle class, most predominantly represented in film and, and uh uh, Hollywood and these other areas, but not only, um, who, who not only undertook uh, this, this campaign to destroy the careers as well as in certain circumstances the lives of many of uh, male stars and, and uh, uh, artistic layers, but also to carry out the attack on the democratic rights of all women because, of course, the basis of the, the uh, maxim that women have to be believed um, is, of course, the evisceration of the, the, the legal right of men uh, to, to claim innocence until proven guilty. Um, and this has been, been utilised 
uh, I mean, in in multiple areas of and, and for the promotion, particularly of of these uh, layers of of the middle class, um, and of course, under conditions where, with the exception of Harvey Weinstein, every single time that any of these allegations have been tested in a court of law, they have been found to be uh, false and thrown out, uh, including in this country uh, as well as as, uh, in the United States. And I think that but the essential issue that is bound up here is the attempt to divert the working class from uh, a class struggle the mobilization on the basis of class a, a class movement against capitalism and i just will will uh, finish off with a quote uh, that clara zetkin who was a german socialist she was in the social uh, democratic party initially and then the spartacus, spartacus league and then uh, the german communist party um, and as she raised in, in 1896, and she was referring to uh, the, to, as she says, the bourgeois woman's demand for sex equality in carrying on an occupation means nothing else than the realisation of free trade and free competition between men and women. The realisation of this demand awakens a conflict of interest between the women and men of the middle class and the intelligentsia. On the other hand, the liberation struggle of the proletarian woman cannot be, as it is for the bourgeois woman, a struggle against the men of her own class. She fights, and she's referring to proletarian women, hand in hand with the men of her class. So I think she couldn't have said it better. I think that's the essential issue. Thank you, Comrade Cheryl. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, for their important contributions today, in particular, uh, Comrade Jaya Sekera, uh, tuning in from Sri Lanka. Uh, I think your report and contribution has been absolutely essential to the discussion today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the participants. I understand we didn't get to everybody's questions, but this is just the start of the discussion. Um, We want to get in contact with you. We want to have more discussion. Uh, We ask you to leave your contact details with us. You can do that either through messaging us through the chat, just make sure it's sent only to hosts and panelists, or you can email us. Uh, There should be, the email will come out in the chat, sep at sep.org.au. We want to get to your questions. We want to answer them. uh, And we certainly can after this meeting. So, Please get in, you know, leave your details so we can get in contact with you uh, and continue the discussion. But with that, I will draw the discussion portion of the meeting to a close. Just before we end, I, I have a few announcements to go through, including pointing everybody here today uh, to uh, our important books uh, that we have for sale, our critical Marxist literature that can be purchased on our website. Uh, I want to just point out and highlight some critical books that have been published, uh, in particular, uh, recently published Pipe River, The Crime and Cover-Up. This goes through the November 19th, 2010 explosion that occurred in Pipe River in New Zealand. 29 workers lost their lives. This was an entirely preventable uh, disaster and was the direct result of the Pipe River coal putting profits before lives. Uh, Following the disaster, a rapid cover-up operation was put into effect in which the National Party, Labor and the unions worked together to prevent any action from being taken against the the company and, frankly, to cover up their own role in this. Uh, This has been, uh, it's a collection of a series of our most recent uh, articles, uh, speeches at our public meeting. Uh, It's a it's published uh, and written by uh, Comrade Tom Peters, who leads the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand. Uh, I mean, it's an essential purchase. It's an event not just of significance for the New Zealand working class, but the international working class, because in every country around the world, workers are dying uh, being uh, as a result of, in one form or another, uh, you know, destruction of working conditions, I mean, and the lack of care for, for workers' lives. 
No sharper example of that is the question of COVID, which as we've gone through has killed uh, upwards of 20 million people worldwide on the altar of profit. Uh, it's $22 plus postage if you get a paperback and uh, $5 for an e-publication. The, I'll move through the others uh, quick. I mean, the next book is A Quarter Century of War. Again, this is a, a critical book that uh, analyzes the progression of military interventions and geostrategic crisis, the crises as they developed over the past quarter century. It's more relevant e than ever. The three decades of US-led wars uh, are really leading to the potential outbreak of a third world war. This one can be purchased for $30 in paperback or $13 for an e-publication. Uh, the next book is the Historical Foundations uh, document of our party. I mean, this reviews and examines, uh, as it says, the most critical political experiences of the Australian working class throughout the 20th century within the context of the global economic, political and social processes. This one is $15. Uh, and we have it just as a, as a paperback uh, plus postage. And finally, uh, I'll point to uh, what the Royal Commission in Australia's trade unions revealed. Uh, this is in response, I mean, the Prime Minister at the time, Coalition Prime Minister Tony Abbott, um, organised an uh, investigation, a Royal Commission into the Australian trade unions. It was not in any way to reveal union corruption as much as to attack the democratic rights of workers, but what it revealed itself um, was that unions have absolutely nothing to do with uh, defending the rights of workers. Uh, so our pamphlet examines those critical questions. That is $5, uh, again, plus postage. So I encourage everybody to, if you haven't already, uh, purchase these books and begin the expansion uh, of your Marxist library. Finally, um, I will uh, just like to end with a few announcements. Firstly, uh, next, uh, next Sunday at 1 p.m., uh, that is June the 19th, uh, we will have uh, a meeting of the Committee for Public Education entitled The Crisis of Public Education, The Betrayal of Teachers' Unions and the Need for Independent Rank and File Committees. It will review the disaster that has developed in public schools and the responsibility by the Australian Education Union, but also other unions, including the New South Wales Teachers' Federation. The discussion will also outline a political perspective including the building of rank and file committees to fight for decent wages and conditions for educators and for a properly resourced, universal, accessible public education system. This is a public meeting in which we encourage everybody to attend. Uh, the next announcement, uh, we have uh, a series of uh, rank and file committee meetings that are held uh, throughout uh, the week. Uh, they are regular meetings. Uh, that includes the CFPE, postal workers, health workers. Uh, and this Wednesday at 7.30, we have our regular health workers uh, rank and file committee meeting. Uh, if you are a health worker and you would like to attend, please get in contact with us. You can see in the chat uh, the email to, to let us know and we can give you the link and you can attend uh, and join our meeting. Finally, uh, I'd like to... Uh, make two appeals. One, I think as we have gone through uh, and, uh, and detailed, we were deregistered due to the anti-democratic electoral laws that were passed last year. Uh, we took up the fight uh, to, uh, to against these anti-democratic electoral laws uh, and we still want to uh, become registered as a political party. But for that, we need more electoral members. Uh, and I, I do appeal to everyone today who are not already uh, to join as an electoral member. Um, this you know, is critical in our fight to uh, against these laws uh, and so that we can uh, return to being a registered political party uh, and continue to fight uh, in the next election. But finally, and I think most importantly, uh, I ask you all to consider making the most important decision of your life and apply today to join the SEP as full members and to dedicate your life to the construction of the International Committee of the Fourth International, the World Party of, Trotsky, uh, of Socialist Revolution. I think as our speakers made clear, what confronts the working class is not simply socialism as a better option. Capitalism is leading the world to barbarism, whether it be war abroad with nuclear consequences or the absolute 
destruction of the living conditions and intolerability of society that's being created. The only answer uh, is socialism and, uh, and we want, you know, and we ask you to make the decision, uh, the critical decision to join this party to take up the fight for world socialist revolution. So uh, again, you'll see uh, the, uh, the links in the chat to join and get in contact with us. Again, I would like to thank you all for your attendance. Thank our speakers, Comrade uh, Cheryl, Comrade uh, Jaya Sekera, Comrade Oscar, uh, for their important reports and contributions. Uh, and again, encourage you all, get in contact with us. Let's continue this discussion. So with those final comments, I'll call the meeting close. Thank you, everybody.